So, welcome to today's lecture. What we will do today is uh, continue our uh, discussion on the uh, Rayleigh-Taylor problem from where we left off uh, yesterday, okay. And uh, this, remember, is the problem where we have two liquids, one on top of the other, okay. And what we had done was uh, we had found the steady state, which was the stationary state, and then we did the linearization. We had the linearized equations. We uh, assumed a normal form for the disturbance in terms of some periodic disturbance in x and y and then uh, we reduced it to an ordinary differential equation in z and uh, what we finally found was that the solution in the first liquid is given by this expression which is valid for in the range minus infinity less than z less than 0 and this is valid uh, in the range or the domain 0 less than z less than infinity, okay. And uh, on the way, we did, I got this from the equation of continuity and this is uh, something which we have used uh, to get this expression. We did the elimination, okay. I would be needing this later, so I have just written this down. Now, our objective is to find these constants and go ahead with the solution. And remember what we want to do is find out um, what kind of wave numbers are going to grow, what kind of wave numbers are going to decay. So that is the idea. So we want to get a relationship between the growth rate which is sigma and alpha, okay, that is the dispersion curve. But that tells me that this wavelength is going to grow, this wavelength is not going to grow. And how is it that the disturbance is going to manifest itself? So for that, I need to solve this W1 and W2 and uh, there are four constants and we are going to use the fact that W1 at star at uh, z equals minus infinity should tend to 0 as z goes to minus infinity, okay. This implies that uh, b equals 0, okay. Similarly, w star 2 star at z equals plus infinity should tend to 0 and this implies C is 0, okay. So basically what this means is W1 star equals A e power alpha z, okay, and W2 star is D e power minus alpha z, okay. So I have used two boundary conditions to get rid of two constants. I still have two unknowns which I have to determine, the A and the D. And uh, what we are going to do now is use the, uh, in, now that we are allowing the interface to deform, we need to use the kinematic boundary condition and we also need to use the uh, normal stress boundary condition. Uh, like I was mentioning yesterday, when we are looking at the invisible limit, what we have to do is let go of one of the boundary conditions, okay. So when, because the viscosity is 0, I have two conditions which we need to satisfy, which is the normal stress and the shear stress. The shear stress condition is not invoked, is not used because, you know, it is in some sense trivially satisfied because the viscosity is 0 on both sides, so you get 0 equals 0, okay. The normal stress boundary condition is what we have to use and that is what we will be using. So let us look at the kinematic boundary condition. And uh, this is a small recap of whatever we did earlier. So when this is a flat interface and this is given by z equals 0 
and uh, what we need to do is worry about the situation where the interface can possibly get deflected, okay. And so, here the interface is going to be given by a function of this kind, okay. We write this in an implicit form f of x comma y comma z comma t as z minus h of x comma y comma t equal to 0, okay. And the kinematic boundary condition follows from the fact that df by dt is 0. This is the kinematic boundary condition, okay. And uh, when I use this, what do I get? df by dt plus the velocity vector times gradient of f equals 0, dotted with gradient of f equals 0, okay. That is the uh, uh, form for the substantial derivative. df by dt is nothing but minus dx by dt. But uh, what I want to do is, uh, since I want to keep in mind that this perturbation is infinitesimal, okay, I am going to uh, write the z as epsilon times h of x comma y comma t. Well, then it makes it easier for me to do this uh, order of epsilon uh, analysis, okay. So, remember this is an infinitesimal perturbation and I had forgotten to put this epsilon there. So, I am just saying that it is uh, a small deviation from the z equals 0, okay. And that is what I have done. So, now minus df by dt and order epsilon, this is going to be multiplied by epsilon. Okay, plus u partial derivative of f with respect to x, which is um, minus epsilon dh dx plus v times, and it is all multiplied by, okay, dh by dy plus w times df by dz. Okay. Remember, the u and the v and the w are the actual velocities. Okay. The u, v and w, u, v, w are the actual velocities. I have not done any uh, breaking this up in the form of a steady state plus a perturbation. So, what is u? u is actually uss plus epsilon u, u tilde okay and h remember is your perturbation itself so actually um, u is uss plus epsilon u uh, tilde v is vss plus epsilon v tilde and so on and so forth so when i now substitute for u uss plus epsilon u tilde i'll get epsilon u tilde the disturbance i'll get epsilon v tilde the disturbance here Okay, so then this becomes of order epsilon squared. This becomes of order epsilon squared. W will be epsilon W tilde. So what this means is, at order epsilon, this equation reduces to W tilde equal to dh by dt. Okay, so um, I proceed further and I write this as minus epsilon dh by dt plus epsilon times U tilde with the minus sign epsilon squared times dh dx minus epsilon squared times v tilde dh dy okay plus epsilon w tilde equal to 0 and this is order epsilon squared these two terms are of order epsilon squared and therefore we we get w tilde equals dh by dt that is your kinematic boundary condition at order epsilon. That makes sense. The rate at which the h is changing with time is my vertical component of velocity. That is what it says, okay. Now, remember this is going to be valid for both the phases. So, w1 tilde is going to be equal to dh by dt if I write for the first phase. If I write for the second phase, it is going to be w2 tilde is equal to dh by dt, okay. So, so, we have 
W1 tilde equals ds by dt which is equal to W2 tilde for each phase. This is another interface. So, in other words W1 tilde will be equal to W2 tilde ok. Um, now, I have assumed that the perturbations and remember H is also a perturbation. All the perturbations are of the form periodic in x and y and growing in time ok. So, now how am I going to assume this H? H is a function of x, y and t correct and so this is going to be of the form h a constant multiplied by e power sigma t e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y ok. So, I am assuming this in fact yesterday at the end of the class Suraj was asking me why does the alpha x and the alpha y have to be the same in both the phases. See the two phases are actually coupled to each other and they are coupled to each other through this boundary condition ok. The h is going to vary as alpha x and alpha y and that is going to decide how the velocity in one liquid is changing, how the velocity in the other liquid is changing. So, the coupling of these velocities is actually occurring through this boundary condition. So, this is what is going to make sure that the wave numbers are the same in both the two liquids in both the liquids ok. So, what I am going to do now is I am going to substitute this h here and you already know what is w1 tilde and w2 tilde it is and this remember is evaluated at w1 tilde we already know what it is a e power alpha z. So, w1 tilde is a e power alpha z and I am going to evaluate this at z equal to 0 the interface ok and uh, e power alpha z multiplied by e power i alpha x x plus i alpha y y times e power sigma t equals h times e power sigma t alpha y y ok. So, this when I look at this I am going to be looking at evaluating this at z equal to 0. I take z equal to 0 because when I evaluate this at z equal to epsilon h I, I would do a Taylor series expansion ok. If I want to calculate z at epsilon h I will get the value of e alpha to the power alpha z at 0 plus the next term which will be uh, order epsilon lower ok. So, what I am saying is this guy this is this here at z equal to 0 yields a equals h ok. So, this cancels off with that and that is what I get and I can use the other one w2 tilde and I would get um, a and d ok. So, my job is now reduced to what I have just found out is that a equals d and my job now is reduced to finding out this either a or d whatever you want and for that I go back to using the boundary condition and anyway I am going to be able to find the uh, solution only to within an arbitrary constant ok. So, what I am going to do is you find the or use the normal stress boundary condition. Yeah, it should be h sigma. You are absolutely right. I think it should be h sigma is right. I want to differentiate this with respect to time. I would not get a sigma here. Yeah, yeah, otherwise I would have been in trouble very soon. So, a sigma is important. Yeah, yeah, let us keep that. Now, the normal stress boundary condition is going to be a balance of the stresses right. So, I am going to write this as p 1 minus n dot t dot n 
minus p2 minus n dot t2 dot n equals gamma times del dot n. This is a boundary condition which we had derived long time ago telling you that the difference in the pressures is going to be balanced by the surface tension and the curvature. Okay. Now, since we have assumed things to be inviscid, these two terms are going to drop off. Okay. Again, uh, and what this basically reduces to is P1 minus P2 equals gamma del dot n since T1 equals T2 equals 0 for an inviscid liquid. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to evaluate del dot n. Okay. Now, uh, how do you evaluate del dot n? You already know how to do this. N is written as gradient of f divided by the absolute value of the gradient of f. And remember, f is z minus epsilon h of x comma y comma t. Okay. So, the gradient of f is minus epsilon h subscript x that is a partial derivative with respect to x times E x the unit vector in the x direction minus epsilon h y times the unit vector in the y direction plus E z. When I differentiate with respect to z, I get 1. Okay. That is my gradient of f. And so, n will turn out to be, n will turn out to be what? Minus epsilon h x minus um, E x minus epsilon h y E y plus E z divided by square root of 1 plus epsilon squared h x squared plus epsilon squared h y squared. Okay. That is my n. I need to get del dot n. Okay. So, what is del dot n? It is E x d by d x plus E y d by d y plus E z d by d z dotted with this n which I have just found out. Uh, minus epsilon h x e x minus epsilon h y e y plus e z h x squared plus h y squared. That is what I need to do. Okay. Now, since I am taking the dot product, only the terms and since the unit vectors E x, E y, E z do not change with x, y, z, okay, this basically reduces to calculating d by d x of minus epsilon h x divided by square root of 1 plus h x squared plus h y squared, okay, uh, minus or plus d by dy of minus epsilon h y divided by square root of 1 plus h x squared plus h y squared. Is an epsilon squared? Right? That is a epsilon squared in the denominator, yes. That is an epsilon squared in the denominator and that is important, yes, I have it there. And here also there is an epsilon squared, okay. Now, this guy is not going to make any contribution because the derivative with respect to z, this guy is independent of z. 
okay. So, only this is going to, only these two terms are going to uh, give a contribution because this is independent of the z variable, it only depends upon x and y, okay. Uh, I am just going to illustrate one thing and then you people can differentiate this and verify for yourself uh, how it is done for the two dimensional problem. I am going to just do a little bit of algebra just to show you that this reduces to uh, a simplified form containing only the second derivative of x with respect to x. So, for this uh, to just reduce the math on the board, we will neglect changes in the y direction. I mean just so that when I differentiate I do not make mistakes, okay. So, you guys can uh, afford to make mistakes and uh, correct yourselves, right. So, hopefully this will reduce the mistakes I make. So, what is this? Uh, change in the y direction means I am going to put h y equal to 0 and if I put h y equal to 0, I just want to show that this reduces to a simplified form at order epsilon, that is the whole idea. Okay, I am interested in what is this term at order epsilon, okay. We have already done this. So, anyway I need to do this for the sake of other people who may have not done the assignment, okay. So, I will just do this once and then we will stop. So, I will not bore you too much. So, now here we are, um, this is h y is 0 and I need to use the quotient rule for the differentiation squared times the derivative of the numerator which is minus epsilon h x x then minus of the derivative of the uh, uh, denominator times derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator so squared divided by 1 plus epsilon squared h x squared. Okay. So, now when I differentiate that, what do I get? This equals square root of uh, 1 plus epsilon squared hx squared times minus epsilon hxx plus epsilon hx times the derivative of this thing is nothing but half of divided by square root of 1 plus epsilon squared h x squared, right. Multiplied by That's what it is, yeah. And then that thing is divided by one plus epsilon squared h x squared into two should come here, yeah. That's right. So that gets, gets rid of that. Now I take the LCM of the numerator, and what do I get? One plus epsilon squared h x squared times minus epsilon h x x. divided by 1 plus to the power 3 by 2 and uh, you will see that this guy multiplied by this knocks off that and what I am left with is minus epsilon h x x divided by 1 plus epsilon squared h x squared to the power 3 by 2, okay that is your actual curvature. And that's, this is a form which you are possibly familiar with when you did your course in calculus you must have come across this form with the second derivative on the top and to the power 3 by 2 in the denominator, okay. Now if you want to do a, an order of epsilon uh, analysis, you would do a binomial theorem expansion of this, you would get uh, 1 minus something which is of order epsilon which contains epsilon in it and so at order epsilon, so using binomial theorem, theorem, 
this is minus epsilon hxx times 1 plus epsilon squared hx squared to the power minus 3 by 2 and this is nothing but minus epsilon hxx. Okay. So, the whole idea, I did that little bit of algebra to tell you that at order epsilon, this particular term gives me epsilon hxx. If you now retain that hy also, you would get a minus epsilon hyy, the curvature in the other direction. So, right now I have assumed no changes in the y direction, things are flat in the y direction, changes only in the x direction. So, changes only in the x direction give me this as the curvature, changes in the y direction will give me analogously minus epsilon hyy, okay. So, that was the idea. Similarly, in the y direction, if hy is not equal to 0, we get the curvature is minus epsilon hyy, okay. Yeah, so that is my del dot n term at order epsilon and uh, now I can go and write the boundary condition. The boundary condition was P1 minus P2 equals gamma times del dot n. That is my full fledged boundary condition. Okay, P1 minus P2 is gamma del dot n that is valid for uh, the actual variables. Okay. Now, I am going to write and this is, this is valid at z equals epsilon h. Okay. The boundary condition has to be applied at the interface which is z equals epsilon h. What, what did I just find out? Del dot n is at order epsilon, it is minus gamma epsilon times hxx plus hyy. That is what we found for the curvature, okay. And this is now being evaluated at order epsilon. What about P1 and P2? This is actual pressure. So, P1 remember is going to be written as P1 SS plus epsilon P1 tilde. Okay, because this is the actual pressure, I am writing it in terms of the base state plus the deviation from the base state. So, I am going to substitute this here P1 SS plus epsilon P1 tilde minus P2 SS plus epsilon P2 tilde equals minus gamma epsilon times hxx plus hyy. Okay. I want to group P1 and this is evaluated z equals epsilon h. So, I am going to write this as P1 ss minus P2 ss evaluated at epsilon h plus epsilon times P1 tilde minus P2 tilde minus gamma epsilon hxx plus hyy. This is my normal stress boundary condition, okay. I am evaluating this particular boundary condition at z equals epsilon h, everything is at z equals epsilon h. Now, what is P1 SS? P1 SS was uh, minus rho 1 gz, right from what we got. P1 SS, remember, yeah. So, now I am going to substitute this as minus rho 1 gz, substitute this as minus rho 2 gz and evaluate this at epsilon h, okay, because this is a boundary condition. So, now I write this as, uh, so this gives me rho 2 minus rho 1 g 
epsilon small h plus epsilon times p1 tilde minus p2 tilde equals minus gamma epsilon hxx plus hyy. So, that is my normal stress boundary condition at order epsilon. Okay. Now, these variables contain both x, y and time dependency, right? And I want to write this in terms of the star variables, I, in fact, that is what I am going to do. So, h is going to be written as rho 2 minus rho 1 times, so at order epsilon, I have g and small h, remember, is h times e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y plus sigma t. Okay, that is the form we assumed for small h. For pressure, it is going to be P1 star of z minus P2 star of z and this is going to be evaluated as z equal to 0 e power i alpha x x plus alpha y y plus sigma t. Okay, and uh, must be equal to gamma times, I have the epsilon here, so this is at order epsilon, okay. I have gamma times, when I differentiate this way to x, I would get uh, alpha squared, so I will get um, minus is already there, so I will get alpha x squared plus alpha y squared times h. plus sigma t, okay. So, my point is this is cancelling everywhere and what I am left with is this condition h plus h. Okay, that is the equation which I get from the normal stress boundary condition. So, now ideally what I want to do is I want to get conditions under which I have a non-zero solution. Okay. So, I want to get an equation which contains only h. This P1 star for example contains um, this particular term is independent of h. So, I want to use my earlier uh, relationships to see if I can find p1 star in terms of uh, some h variable. So, uh, the idea is I am going to use p1 star and p2 star. I am going to use this relationship here to relate p1 star in terms of the derivative of w1. I already know what the solution for w1 is. Okay, And so, I can get w1 and if you remember, a and D we have obtained in terms of H. So, the idea is I am going to write this particular term in terms of capital H. Okay. Then I have an equation which contains something multiplied by H plus something multiplied by H equals something multiplied by H and I want a non-zero solution. So, I can knock off H and get a relationship between um, sigma which has to occur somewhere and alpha squared. Okay. That is the idea. So, that is the strategy. So, we, uh, so, what is P1 star? From this equation of continuity that we got, P1 star is minus rho 1 sigma dW1 star by dz divided by alpha squared. Okay? And that we got yesterday by doing some elimination. So, I am just using that relationship. P2 star is going to be minus rho 1 sigma by alpha squared or 2 sigma by alpha squared dW2 star by dz. Similarly, yeah? 
Is that a problem? Where? Yeah. I hear. Uh, I don't think so. Because there's already a negative sign there, isn't it? So when I differentiate this with respect to x, uh, I'll get minus uh, alpha squared, minus alpha x squared. E power i alpha x, I differentiate this, I get minus uh, plus i squared alpha x squared. So I'll get this. Okay. Now what is dw1 star by dz? It is nothing but a alpha e power alpha z. I can use this. Okay. So this is nothing but minus rho 1 sigma a alpha e power alpha z divided by alpha squared. And this is minus rho 2 sigma d and I am differentiating this respect to z. So I am going to get a minus alpha here divided by alpha squared e power minus alpha z. The point is these two terms are going to be evaluated at z equal to 0. And this in fact is your, the basis of this domain perturbation method which we saw earlier. Now if you remember I harped on this being evaluated at the interface. Okay. Now this is a base state and I want this equation to be valid at order epsilon. Since it is to be valid at order epsilon, this is the base state. So I have used z equals epsilon h here. This is already a perturbation. Okay, so this is already of order epsilon. So now if I want, so this has to be multiplied by something which is evaluated at the base state. So the z is has to be zero. Okay, if I want to evaluate this at epsilon h, then this would be a higher order term. Okay, I have not done the formal derivation here, but maybe in the next problem we'll do it more formally. So the idea is that this is going to be evaluated at z equal to 0 and now I can substitute this here and remember we already have a relationship between a, d and h. We derived that a and d are a equals d equals sigma h. So I think uh, I got everything now what I wanted. I am going to substitute all this back here and get a relationship for h or get a relationship between um, alpha and sigma squared rho 2 minus rho 1 g h plus p 1 star is this minus p 2 star. So I have again plus here, the p 1 star is the minus sign rho 1, okay, it is minus rho 1. When I substitute sigma h here, I get sigma squared h and this is evaluated at 0 and divided by alpha, okay, that is that, minus p2 star minus minus is plus, again minus, okay, equals gamma alpha square h. Okay, yeah. I don't think I made any mistake. Okay. So now, what do I have? I want to get my growth rate, sigma squared. Sigma, remember, is my growth rate. Gamma, remember, is my surface tension, and alpha is my wave number. It tells me something about the periodicity. Okay, and this I'll just write here is my surface tension. And clearly, we seek h to be not equal to 0. That is what we want. And that is the condition which gives you your dispersion curve. And uh, what I am going to do is, this is a negative sign. I am going to move this to that side and move that to this side. And I get rho 2 minus rho 1 g h. Okay, I keep this here. I am bringing that here minus gamma alpha squared, h goes off, 
square equals rho 1 plus rho 2 by alpha sigma squared. Okay? So, in other words, sigma squared equals, and that is my final expression, g minus gamma alpha squared times alpha divided by rho 1 plus rho 2. Okay, that is what you should get. Now, if you do not have any surface tension, okay, if gamma is 0, then your relationship reduces to sigma squared equals rho 2 minus rho 1 g divided by rho 1 plus rho 2 times alpha. Okay? What this means is, this remember is the growth rate of the disturbance. If rho 2 is greater than rho 1, this is positive and you would have the growth rate, you will have a positive value for the growth rate when you take the square root. One will be positive, one will be negative. Okay? So, if rho 2 is greater than rho 1, sigma is positive. The system is unstable. Okay? And that is perfectly fine. You possibly did not have to do all this analysis to find this because you know that if the denser liquid is on top, it is going to be unstable. Okay? But um, you have some information that the growth rate varies linearly with the wave number. The more the wave number, the more is the uh, growth rate. Okay? And if um, rho 2 is less than rho 1, what happens? This is negative. Okay? And sigma squared is negative. That means, what is the real part? The real part is 0 because you are purely imaginary plus or minus i multiplied by something. So, sigma, so the linear stability analysis cannot really tell you anything because you are on the boundary. Okay? So, you really cannot conclude that it is stable just because uh, by doing this linear stability analysis. But if you can, if you have rho 2 greater than rho 1, you know for sure it is unstable. Okay? So, this real part is 0. That means, the real part of sigma is 0 and we are on the boundary of stable and unstable region. And the other thing you observe is all wave numbers alphas grow if rho 2 is greater than rho 1. All the wave numbers are going to grow. Whereas, if you now have a finite value of gamma, if gamma is not equal to 0 and if I remember correct, sigma squared is, the numerator is this. Gamma alpha squared. Okay. When will the growth rate uh, be positive? Sigma squared is positive if rho 2 minus rho 1 g is greater than gamma alpha squared or alpha squared is less than rho 2 minus rho 1 g 
divided by gamma. Okay. So what does this mean? Sigma square is positive when your alpha square is going to be low. Okay. So low wave numbers or large wavelengths means are unstable. Correct. Wave number and wavelength are reciprocal. So low wave numbers, that's what we said, right? Sigma squared is positive if this is positive, because this guy is anyway positive, if the wave number is positive, this guy is positive. And so only if this is positive, if this this for this to be positive, your wave number should be low than a threshold. Okay, if this is lower, then you have instability. Or the wavelength is large. So if the wavelength is large means it is varying slowly. And uh, or if I write it the other way, large wave numbers or low wavelengths are stable. That means if the uh, periodicity is very, very sharp, that means the curvature is going to be very high, then the surface tension is dominating, okay? Because the curvature multiplied by the surface tension is the one which is contributing to your normal stress boundary condition, right? So that dominates. When the wavelength is low, that means there is a very sharp curvature. Then sigma comes into the picture, the, uh, not sigma, the gamma, the uh, surface tension, and that has a stabilizing influence. So point here is that gamma has a stabilizing influence. Okay, the point I'm trying to make here is that surface tension has a stabilizing influence because this is associated with a minus sign. Okay, and surface tension is going to dominate when alpha is going to be large. The wave number is going to be large, or the wavelength is going to be uh, low. Okay, so surface tension dominates and stabilizes for large wavelengths. Oh, sorry, for low wavelengths. Uh, or large wave numbers, okay? I think that's the message from this analysis.